Jesus says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. The Gospel of our Lord. What would you do if someone punched you in the face? Would you mind if I punched you in the face? I mean, I, I know I'm not in very good shape, but you know, I, I have some muscle under this blazer. There's something there. I mean, really, would you mind if I punched you in the face? Any takers? I mean, I've watched enough Rocky movies. I think I could throw a mean punch, right? Okay, I'll do hmm? it. You do it? Yeah, you're not invited. Get up, sit down. <laughs> yeah, and you know kids. I'm not going to take out a kid. No? Nobody wants to get punched in the face? Okay. He might be a pastor someday. I don't know. <laughs> this is absurd, right? No one would expect to come on a Sunday morning and get punched in the face by their pastor, right? I mean, you didn't expect that, right? That would be downright shocking, right? Well, Jesus' words here in Luke are shocking. In fact, they are meant to shock. <laughs> And what Jesus outlines is not just unusual, it's highly unusual. Let's just review it again. If someone slaps you on one cheek, make sure you turn and let them have a smack at the other one. If someone takes your coat, well, make sure you offer them your shirt next. Give to everyone, everyone who asks. If anyone takes what belongs to you, your purse, your house, your car, don't make a stink about getting it back. And when you get cursed, return a blessing. I would say these words in Jesus are downright absurd. And everybody gathered around him that day on the plane would have been thinking the same thing. Is this guy crazy? And my answer to that would be yes and no. Yes, there's something very crazy in Jesus' words today. And no, it's not all that crazy in the economy of God. Pastor Alice was here last weekend, and I know that she laid some great groundwork about Luke chapter 6 being what we call the Sermon on the Plain. And what I read today is a passage that continues in that same sermon. And before this passage today, we're told that a large crowd has gathered around Jesus, a large one. But he directs what he's saying today to his newly chosen disciples. We're literally told, Luke tells us that Jesus looks at his disciples before he begins speaking. That's really important for us when we look at these absurd words of Jesus. Because if they're directed at his disciples, then they're being used as a teaching method, as a way for his disciples to build a distinct ethic, a central theme in their work on his behalf. And that ethic is something that Jesus repeats twice in today's passage. Love your enemies. Yes. Right? <laughs> Love your enemies. 
Sorry, I, I didn't get the right screen there, but this is coming up in three sentences, so we're just going to leave it, okay? Love your enemies. Three words. So even though these words are absurd, they're meant to be. Jesus is using them as an exaggeration to drive home his central point about loving your enemies. It's Jesus laying out a fundamental attitude, and his disciples are meant to imagine their life out of that attitude of, of absurdity. But you might want to ask, why? Why, Jesus, are you absurd? Why should we be absurd? This doesn't make any sense to our logical minds. Well, I think there's a few reasons. The first is that this absurdity is who God is, and Jesus knows that. Did you know that we worship an absurd God? Is that ever a word you'd use? The psalm that we read today responsibly, responsibly excuse me, in our pericope reading articulates this so well. And I just want to read a little bit of that again for us. I'm sorry that I have a little bit different version. I think, I'm not sure what translation you all use. I use the NIV. So I apologize if the, if the language is a little different. But let's just, let's just read this again. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of God's benefits, who forgives all your sins, heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Now think about this part again in this, in this lens of absurdity. God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our sins. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who fear God. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. An absurdly extravagant, loving God. A God who cares for God's people so much that we're crowned with the very things that define God, love and compassion. And I want you to know this concept of a God caring for people was so very absurd in ancient times, let alone the Greco-Roman world of Jesus. Gods did not care about people. They weren't involved with people. If they ever came to earth, it was only to mess with them. So Jesus' absurd words here about loving our enemies is really a reflection of who he knows God to be. A God that doesn't deal with us as we deserve, but who loves us to the heavens and back. So why else does Jesus tell us to be absurd? Why? First of all, it's who God is. And second, Jesus knows that our enemies need absurdity. You know, Joseph had a few enemies. In Genesis 45, he had a few. Sweetheart, you are not supposed to be talking. <laughs> Joseph had a few enemies. This is drawing near to the Joseph cycle in Genesis. And at, at this point, what's interesting is that in the Joseph story, his enemies are in his own household. They're his brothers. Do you remember what his brothers did to him? I mean... This was 20 years ago in our, in our uh, passage today, but 20 years ago in our passage, Joseph, his brothers, strip him, throw him in a pit, sell him into slavery, and then tell their beloved father that he was ripped apart by wild beasts. Pretty good ways to become someone's enemy, right? Right? But then here we are, Joseph's brothers has, have come to him in Egypt, and they don't know who he is yet. And they've come to him because there's a massive famine in the land and they need food or they will literally die. And so they come to Joseph 20 years removed and then Joseph finally reveals who he is. And this is what he says to his brothers. Now remember, think about this in the context of absurdity. This is what your brothers had done to you. This is how, Jason, this is how Jason, Joseph responds to them. You intended to harm me but it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Absurd. 
Joseph is condemned to slavery in Egypt, removed from all family and friends, thrown in jail, accused by Potiphar, thrown in jail again, threatened with death 24 seven, all at his brother's hands. And yet, he tells them that God has providentially used him for the salvation of people. That God had that in mind. Absurd! That God can work through the ugliness of our lives and somehow work it for good? Absurd, right? Joseph understood that his very life was the story of a merciful God. Your very life is the story of a merciful God. A God who safeguards us. And in spite of all that Joseph has suffered, he can see God at work in everything that has happened. Not that God caused it, not that God wanted him to suffer, but that somehow in absurd love, God can work for good in the ugliness of life. God can transform tragic personal circumstances into an opportunity to help others, particularly our enemies, particularly his own brothers. And his brothers needed it. They didn't deserve it, but they needed it. Even our own toxic family members, and I know we all have got them, our enemies within desperately need the absurdity of God's love, of God's mercy, of God's generosity. They need us, like Joseph, to imitate our compassionate God to bring Jesus into their lives. So Jesus teaches absurdity. Why? Well, first of all, it's because that's who God is. Next, it's because Jesus knows our enemies need it. And lastly, why does Jesus teach us about absurdity? Jesus lives it, and he wants us to live it too. I don't think you can get any more absurd, right, than the king of the universe, the prince of peace, the everlasting to everlasting, the alpha and the omega, dying for us, the worst of sinners. God come to live among us as Emmanuel, sent to take the punishment that was our rightful doom. It's absurd. But what's interesting is that this absurdity is all we have, right? All we have is the most precious gift in the world. It's absurdly beautiful. It's absurdly generous. It's absurdly merciful. It's absurdly ours. It is Jesus. And then Jesus tells us, no, no, he commands us that this absurdity must mark our lives in our relationships with others especially those others that are hard to be in relationships with, our enemies. And we follow his lead, his absurd lead. This past Wednesday, I had, I had the privilege of um, <laughs> leading our, our second grade small group time at our church. On Wednesday nights, we have a, a great programming for young kids. And what I normally do on Wednesday nights is I teach a large group. Um, I teach the large group second through fourth grade. But we were short on leaders, so I got to sit down in a classroom with just the second graders. And what's interesting is our curriculum um, follows along with the church year. So the passage we talked about was the same one in Luke, was about enemies. And so the, the two questions I threw out to these second graders who were pretty rambunctious by the end of the night was, what's an enemy? Because I wanted to know. In a second, second grader's mind, what's an enemy, right? And the second question I asked him was, well, why, why do we love our enemies, right? So I had this sweet little boy in the back, sweet little boy, Ryan. He was so excited. He kept raising his hand to answer questions, but, you know, we were getting around the room. And if you've ever seen the Minion movies, he was kind of like that, like just that, you know, hand, pick on me, pick me. And so finally we get to Ryan. And <laughs> so he first says, okay, I have, I, have, I have answers to both of your questions, but I want to answer the second one first, and then I'll answer the, the, the first one about who my enemies are. I said, okay, you just do whatever you want. Just answer, answer the question. So he rattles off as, as fast as a freight train, right? Love changes people, and the sofa is my enemy. So if you got that, I'll make it slower. Love changes people, and the sofa is my enemy. 
So he unpacks that a month ago he had jumped off of his sofa and broke his arm, so his sofa is his enemy now. <laughs> but if we, if we back up to the first part of what he said, as a sweet, innocent second grader, love changes people. I, I kid you not, I was floored. In the moment, I was floored. Because that's the power in all of this, right? That the absurd love of Jesus changes people. And I know it's true because it's changed me. And it's changed you. And we're pretty tough cookies, right? I, I know I am. I'm a pretty tough cookie. And now we've been told in our psalm passage that we've been crowned with compassion. And that compassion has a purpose. Your very life story is that of redemption to a watching world, just like Joseph. The ugliness and brokenness of your life can and will be worked for good to bring others, even enemies, to Christ Jesus. You've been given the same absurd commands as those 12 gathered on the plane that day. The same ones. You are no different, no different than these broken, absurd, redeemed people in this book. You are no different. Your life is an epistle through faith that God will use you for good your life continues God's story, continues God's work of absurdity in this world through Jesus. So I'm not gonna punch you in the face this morning. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not. That would be absurd. But we'll leave this place and live our lives in light of something far more absurd. The love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you pray with me? Loving God, it's, it's a struggle sometimes to wrap our minds around the absurd things that you have laid out for us to do. But that's one of the beautiful things about faith is that we get to struggle that out with you. And we get to struggle that out in a community of faith. We get to struggle that out under the light of grace. We get to struggle that out, Lord, in your, in your good book. And Lord, I ask that you can help us in that with this crown of compassion that you've placed on our heads that we might be that light in our spaces, in our workplaces, in our homes. Even when we go to the grocery store, Jesus, that we could be those people that our enemies see you. And Lord, we know that that's hard and we confess that that's hard and we ask for help every day through your spirit. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the life that you have given us, for the high calling that you have given us, and we ask, Lord, that you would draw so close to us that we might live under that compassion in Jesus' name. Amen.